Hey guys, welcome back to Pop em Up Chem. In this video, we're going to be looking at the catalytic capability of the transition metals and their compounds, and also delve a bit deeper into why coordination complexes exhibit color. But first, let's have a little look at what we did last lesson, a little question on strong field ligands and their relationship between spin free and spin paired complexes. Pause the video to have a go at that. So for this one, if we have a strong field ligand, then we know a strong field ligand is going to be highly attracted to the central metal ion. And so it's going to push through those high energy d orbitals, creating a large repulsion an increased repulsion means we're also going to increase the difference in energy between the low and high energy T2G and EG orbitals. That means that if we have to compare the relative value of delta E with the pairing energy of the lower energy orbitals, then delta E is likely to be larger than P and so we're likely to have spin paired complexes. Turning our attention to transition metals as heterogeneous catalysts. First of all, we want to recall that catalysts speed up the rate of reaction without being used up themselves. So these are really useful in industry um, and also in biology. Now, all heterogeneous means is that they are going to be in a different phase from the reactants. So that could mean that the catalyst is a solid, the reactants are gases, or vice versa, or the reactants are liquid and the catalysts are solid. This is the favorable setup in industry if it's possible because it's easier for us to separate the heterogeneous catalyst at the end of a reaction so that then that catalyst can be reused in further reactions. And there's a few examples of reactions that we'll actually study further as well. We've got the harbor process, so the production of ammonia, and we have the production of sulfur trioxide called the contact process. These are both reactions that we'll be looking at in unit seven in more depth. And the harbor process is catalyzed by solid iron and the contact process by vanadium oxide. They're actually both equilibria, but we won't worry about that right now. There are many other reactions that are also catalyzed by transition metal compounds and the metals themselves, such as the hydrogenation of alkenes or unsaturated fats. And uh, in this case, we use the metal nickel. We'll do more about this reaction specifically in unit 10, when we look at alkenes. Other transition metals such as palladium and platinum are used in the catalytic converters on cars. These are the things that help reduce the emissions coming out of the back of combustion engine cars. Basically, the transition metals are all round team players and they help us with a lot of important reactions. And not just in the heterogeneous catalyst form we use in industry, they also have a big role as homogeneous catalysts. And as the name might suggest, homogeneous means that the reactants are going to be in the same phase as the reactants, which we might not want in industry, but is really important in biology. In fact, many enzyme catalyzed reactions in the body are catalyzed by transition metal ion complexes that act as homogeneous catalysts. Two examples both to do with blood include Fe2 plus being the ion on which hemoglobin group is based around and hemoglobin allows for oxygen transport around the body. And also we have the cobalt 3 plus ion in B12 which has an important role to play in the production of red blood cells. And this is by no means the full extent of their biological activity either. The transition metals are involved in a large number of these kind of processes. Time for a couple of questions to hone our skills on that then. First question, why are heterogeneous catalysts preferred in industry to homogeneous catalysts? Pause the video. Pop them up. So remember in industry, we want to recover the catalysts 
so that we can reuse them and they're easier to separate when they're heterogeneous. Next, give one use of transition metal complexes in the body. Pause the video. Pop them up. Well, you could quote a multitude of different things here, but I just covered oxygen transport in red blood cells with Fe2+, and also red blood cell production with cobalt 3 So what is it about transition metal complexes that make them colored? Well, if we just take the example of this tetrahedral complex, copper with four ammonia ligands and an overall charge of two plus. We're not going to draw it. However, we are going to recognize that it's blue. So what is the significance of it being blue? Well, if we think about passing white light through this complex, there must be some absorbed wavelengths of light. Indeed, in this case, the red and orange wavelengths are absorbed by the complex and that allows for the transmission of the remaining wavelengths of light. And the resulting transmitted light is what gives the complex solution its characteristic color. So why does this happen with transition metal complexes and not with everything? Well, unsurprisingly, it has a lot to do with crystal field theory and the gap that is caused by the split of the d orbitals in the presence of ligands. If we take a complex that has a certain value of delta E and it has some electrons in the lower energy T2G orbitals and some space up in the higher energy EG orbitals. When there is space in these high energy EG orbitals, there can be promotions of low energy electrons up into those orbitals. And it's those promotions, those transitions, which are gonna be key to the color that we observe. This promotion can only happen if there is any incoming radiation that hits the low energy electrons where the radiation's energy is exactly equal to that of delta E. If the radiation's energy is equal to delta E, then it will cause a promotion. It will cause a transition from the lower energy level to the higher energy level, causing the excited state of the complex ion. And in turn, it's that absorbance that corresponds to the color of the complex. We use table 17 in the data booklet to work this out. If we have an absorbance value of let's say 585 nanometers, then the appearance of that complex will be opposite to that on the color wheel. So you just almost draw a line straight through the color wheel. So it will appear roughly 424, a violet blue appearance because all of the light transmitted will have an average of around that color. So this is pretty awesome, really, because at this point, it looks like color, in a sense, more specifically wavelength, can tell us about the energy difference between two atomic orbitals, something that seemingly is qualitative in nature initially can be used to measure the value of delta E. So yes, this is as awesome as it sounds. How do we go about doing it? Well, we know that delta E is equal to HF, and we know that F is equal to C over lambda, where H is Planck's constant. C is, of course, the speed of light. Lambda is the wavelength, in this case, the wavelength absorbed. And F is the frequency. So effectively, once we know the wavelength, we're able to calculate delta E. So let's have a look at an example of this. So here it's telling us we've got an octahedral complex that has a single D electron. And to excite this D electron from the ground state to the excited state, it absorbs light from 450 to 600 nanometers. The maximum absorbance, which is the thing that we're going to focus on, corresponds to delta E and it occurs at 499 nanometers. 
calculate delta E in joules and predict what color the solution will be. Firstly, I'm going to extract my key information, which is the maximum absorbance and what they want me to actually work out. So the maximum absorbance being 499 means my frequency is going to be equal to the speed of light divided by 499 times 10 to the minus 9. Little reminder there that nanometers are meters times 10 to the minus 9. So that gives us our value of our frequency being 6.01 times 10 to the 14 hertz. Once we have our hertz, we can calculate delta E directly using Planck's constant multiplied by the value that we just calculated. So already we found our value for delta E, which is going to equals 3.99 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. Now that's not all the question asks because it also asks us to predict what color the complex will be. So here we're going to use the wavelength of light that was absorbed and we're going to use our color wheel again. So we had an absorbance of 499. So we just draw a straight line across the color wheel and we end up in the red quadrant. So we would expect this complex solution to be red. Just goes to show you with some pretty simple information, we can calculate some pretty interesting things here. I do think this is a good time to mention, however, a little bit of TOK and mainly theories on color. Little disclaimer about crystal field theory. And even though it is super awesome, it doesn't actually explain the spectrochemical series, but it is a model that's based on electrostatic interactions, which makes it perfect for us at the IB, but it has limitations. Specifically, it doesn't explain why the spectrochemical series is in the order that it is. Now, other theories can have other uses such as molecular orbital theory, which we cover briefly in unit four, and that considers the covalent interaction between the central ion and the ligands. But of course, that has limitations also. Ligand field theory, probably one of the most prevalent theories, is an extension of crystal field theory but it includes molecular orbital theory. So it's a little bit advanced for the IB level, but this allows discussion of the ligand metal interaction to be put in terms of electronic energy levels and can help us explain the spectrochemical series more accurately. And there are others as well. And that's really the point I'm trying to make here is how we're going to utilize the information and the model that we're using is key to how we understand the world and how we apply the knowledge that we have. Enough on that then, let's finish up with one question on the theory that you have been studying. So in this complex, we've found a maximum absorbance of 600 nanometers. I want you to have a go at calculating delta E and also predicting what color the solution would appear. Pause the video to have a go. Pop em up! Firstly, we're going to calculate our frequency by dividing our speed of light by our wavelength in meters, not in nanometers, which gives us 5.0 times 10 to the 14. We can then calculate delta E by multiplying that value by Planck's constant. And that gives us our value of delta E, which is 3.3 times 10 to the 19 joules. Now, predicting what color the solution will appear is it absorbs at 600, right in the middle of the orange region. So we would expect this to appear right in the middle of the blue region. And so that closes up this unit. I hope you've enjoyed it. Some work for you to do. Thanks for joining me, guys. Don't forget to like, subscribe, hit the bell icon, and as always, practice makes slightly better.